Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church. Here we are at the end of November, and it is chilly, but we are going to move forward and be warmed up by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So thanks be to God, and here we are in the um, December 3rd, uh, for this Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, we have closed out year A together. If you notice, since um, at the beginning of last year, we were in year A around this time, and now we've closed that out, and we're in year B, the second set of selections for a year of, Christmas, of, of uh, liturgical um, scriptures that will guide us through our year. So let's see what themes we may come up with and how we may learn from one another. Advent means coming or arrival. And so Linda, during the season of Advent, we celebrate coming into the world and watch with expectant hope for Christ coming again. So it's sort of like waiting for Christmas and it also symbolizes waiting for Jesus to come again. Um, we watch, wait and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. That's what it is that we do. <clears throat> in doing so, each of the weeks, Linda, usually it's four weeks of Advent. This year it's three weeks and Christmas Eve, because usually Christmas Eve and Christmas Day are not considered Advent, but they're, they're right there when Jesus comes. And there are four Sundays usually that are celebrated that comprise um, Advent. And they represent, in most churches, the first Sunday is hope. And we light candles, Linda, each Sunday. Okay. Um, and for everyone who is not of the Reformed tradition or outside of the outside of the Reformed tradition that does not celebrate Advent, there are four candles in an Advent wreath or just candles that are there. We light them each one each week with some scripture. The first one is hope. The second week is peace. And those are two purple candles. The third week is joy. And that's a pink candle. And usually we say it's joy and it's really associated with Mary because that's usually the third week of Advent is when we have Mary's Magnificat, when Mary says, you know, she recognizes that my soul, that I am, I am, I am blessed and highly favored by God. And then in the fourth week, it's love. And it's also a purple candle. And on Christmas day, we light the white candle for Christ, if we get an opportunity to do that each year. And looking through our Advent text for this week, um, we're going to be looking through our Advent text through the following lenses, and I'll ask you to go through them with me as we go through these texts and to get your mindset to hear in our scriptures these themes that I'm, that I'm lifting up. Um, for the first week, you'll hear in the scriptures that there's a sense of longing. The second week is a sense of consolation. The third week is reassurance. And this year, the fourth week, even though it's Christmas, will be already is because it, we will be celebrating Christmas Eve. But in all of our texts deal with the fact that God already is here and people are just finding out like the shepherds and so on and so forth. So that's what we'll be doing for the next four weeks. If you want to keep that in mind. OK. okay. So. Our first psalm is Psalm, our psalm of the day is Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7 and verses 17 through 19. You'll notice that not included in this lectionary reading is verses 8 through 16, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move forward. And this is, let's see what I did this. Yeah, that's that. And this is a prayer that the shepherd of Israel would restore the people. In our text, verses 1 through 7, is a community petition asking God to aid in the northern tribes suffering because the northern tribes have suffered from the effects of God's anger. We talked about the separation of the north and the south um, and the tribulations that led into the, um, to the exile. But it, that was a very concentrated suffering that happened with the Assyrians and the other kingdoms that went against and betrayed the northern kingdom for not listening because they didn't listen to God and follow their own instincts. Verses 8 through 13, which 8 through, yeah, 8 through 13, um, recall Israel's founding or the exodus and settlement of Canaan, um, called into question by the enemy's triumph in this, this, this prayer where they're like, God, we're longing for you. Where are you? 
Um, and then 14 through 19 is a prayer, a prayer that asks for God to please act now. So hear these as we read these, this Psalm 81 through 7, 17 through 19. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim shine forth between before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So we have this one through three, asking for the restoration of God and saying, God, where are you? Um, we, are, we are in pain and we are suffering. And then there's a request for deliverance, that kind of a language that is happening later on. Verses 16, the ones that are cut out, I ask you this question are not included in the lectionary, and I ask you, are there any idea why? Because those verses recall Israel's founding or the exodus and settlement of Canaan called into question by the enemy's triumph. Do you understand why for Advent, nobody really wants to hear about all that? <laughs> <laughs> It's because in our Advent text, and as you'll notice, they'll be picking and choosing texts that lead to um, a fulfillment legacy, a Christian fulfillment legacy, that all of these texts are predicting the birth of Jesus. So whether, whether or not they were in our Christian tradition, as we look through, through ways to sort of bolster our faith in Christ, we, we put our calendar together and put these texts around us to sort of tell the story in a way, and this is a story of not just being reminding that, that Israel was founded and that there was exodus and that the enemies are, you know, are triumphant over us. That's, that's, yeah, we can study that another time. But for here, it's really important to recognize that there is a loss of people and a loss of, a loss of community at the time when, before Jesus was born. Um, that's the, one of the whole reasons why Jesus came in the first place was to be, um, a, 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 someone in the wilderness, a voice of hope in the wilderness of God to turn God's, um, make God's kingdom happen and to turn God's will into reality. And that means that the people of Israel at that time, um, we have to recognize the suffering that they were going through, the hopelessness that they felt, the temple that was being, the, the temple that was destroyed during the time of the writing of the gospels and the whole idea of the fact that where are we, who are we, what is going on and we are lost. And so this claim now that, you know, this hopelessness and this understanding of what it's like to, to be longing for God's deliverance is something that our lectionary wants us to try and viscerally feel as we go into waiting for Christ. So that on Christmas, we're like, he's here, he's here. And hope is restored to us. So there's that. This is a prayer that the shepherd, of course, will restore God's people, community petition, asking God to aid the Northern tribes um, from, who are suffering. I already said that. And then these tribes, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, these were the northern tribes. When you look at a map of Israel from the, from the early testament, from the first testament, you'll see that they're named, the sections are named over the tribes of Israel, or the tribes, the tribes of Israel and the sons of Jacob. So you will see, and sons of Jacob and some of, and also the sons of Joseph. And you will see that Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh were territories as well as names of people. So this is the cluster of the northern tribes that separated from Judah, the lower half 
um, in 922 BCE before Common Era. And in 722, Assyria defeated that northern kingdom, seized its territory. And we also see here that God is enthroned upon the cherubim present above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. So it's saying, you, God, we know that you are enthroned and that you are with us. And you are even before those. So stir up your might to come and save us. We believe you. This restore to us, O oh God. Let your face shine so that we may be saved. One of the notions about understanding how it feels when God is angry is that God turns God back, God's back on us. So they're saying, let your face shine. Basically, turn your face around. Because, of course, what happens when the countenance of God is, is, is within the presence of persons, there is a light and there's a shining, right? That's the language that's used for the manifestation of God. It happens with Moses. It happens with a whole bunch of the other folks. There's always this manifestation of light. It's one of the ways that we know that God has arrived. So they're saying, turn your face. Let your face shine so that we may be saved because we know that if we see the light coming from you, even though we cannot look upon your face, that you are present with us and we are saved. Which leads us then into verse four. O Lord, God of hosts. God of hosts. We hear this very often in a lot of our scriptures, but this epithet specifically refers to, um, to God with God's own heavenly army, especially suitable here since God is being asked to fight on behalf of Israel. Whenever you hear the Lord of hosts and God of hosts, in many of the instances where we see these great battles that are going on with, um, with Israel, where they're totally outnumbered by people, such as even the people, the, the, the chariots that went into the Red Sea, you know, there's an army of God that, that is very much envisioned by the people in the first test. Testament that comes out on the battlefield and literally God brings a host of an army to fight for God's people and to do God's bidding. So this is the imagery that they're using. It's like the battlefield. We may feel as if we're alone on the battlefield, but the God of hosts is with us. And that host is God's army fighting and doing the fighting for us, even when we feel outnumbered and lost. How long? is that once again, this request for deliverance language that we see, it's a tradition in this Psalm, Psalm 13, one through two, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? This how long is this great lament and this great request for deliverance? I recognize what we've done, but how long are you gonna be gone? Um, mm. dear God, we were hungry and there was no food. All we had was bread of tears. We were thirsty and there was no water. There were only our tears to drink in full measure. But this verse six, which I didn't note, but I wanted to point out anyway, because I'm going to mention it in another text in Isaiah, this idea of being the scorn of our neighbors and a laughing stock, um, among our neighbors. Israel already had a tough road to hoe. Believe it or not, um, I've read about this in some of the Mesopotamian um, annals of, of mythologies and so on and so forth, that these gods that you very often see are what? They're men, right? Right. They're men. They're, they're physical. They're manifested in men. The idols are sort of men. The, the major gods are have these male attributes and so on and so forth. But the God of Israel is neither male nor female. And no one, and they give this complete allegiance to this God, not a king, to this God. And to give up your power um, as a community and to have no leader is a feminine quality. And, and, ancient ways of thinking about male and female roles for communities. And Israel is pretty much one of the only countries that is always talked about into being subdued like a woman, being scorned at. Um, and they recognize that they're being made fun of and that they're being laughed at, um, especially when they feel as if they're being defeated. 
So let your hand be upon, be the one at your right hand. We talked about the right hand of God, right? The one who's seated at the right hand is the one with power. But let your hand be upon whoever is coming to deliver us, the king. This is also known as, a.k.a. the deliverer. Let your hand be upon the king or the deliverer, the one whom you will make strong or made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you if you bring us, bring us around. Give us life and forever we will call on your name. And then once again, that request, restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. There you are. That is a psalm for our first Sunday in Advent to give us this sense of longing that we want to be delivered desperately from what is going on in our world and from our, our sorrows and from the evils of the world so that God's will will be done on earth. You know, um, I notice at the end, I think it's verse 17, 17 18. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, it's like a never ending conversation. Yes. Humanity has with God. If, and it's all conditional. Oh, yeah. If you do this, we will never. It's, it's like when you were a child and, you know, you used to beg with your, your mom or dad, you know, he said, if you just give me this, I'll never ask you for another thing again in life, you know? And you know, it's a lie. You know, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you know, it's, it's so funny because it's like you say, it's for them, they keep saying, if you just do all of this, they're trying to reinstitute the covenant that they broke. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we'll go back to that. We'll go back to our contract. If you deliver us, we can't do it now because we're suffering, but you know, as soon as you, you deliver us. And it's, and it's like there, something you mentioned about uh, the surrounding cultures, you know, that had these male, gods you know these male attributes it's um sort of like these people well through the prophet is saying that you god want something from us so desperately that you're going to do this for us you know it's mm -hmm. like god you know they have nothing that god needs right absolutely nothing you know but they are acting as if they have something to barter with <laughs> you know, they're, they're, like their praise and their, you know their ador adoration and all they should have been doing that all along mm -hmm. amen mm -hmm. Hence, hence the hence the issue of like when everybody and that's why this is a communal prayer, right? It's not even just something for the priest to go. It's like, come on, y'all, we have to make this resonate so that God will hear us. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Very and good. It was sort of like Moses, you know, like when Moses had these discussions back and forth with God about, you know the value of these people that he was leading, you know, and God was like, I'm going to wipe them all out. You know, da, 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 mm -hmm. he was like, Oh, don't forget, you know, that you're supposed to be this and you're supposed to be that and you made a covenant with us and we are your people and all. And I'm like, wow, you know? Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah. But I believe that we do the same thing even today. Oh, we all, this oh, is sure. human nature, yeah, of course. Same thing. That's what I was saying. It's, you know, humanity. Since the time, you know, walking around in, in, in the Garden of Eden, you know, and uh, Adam told, you know, God, well, it's that woman that you gave me. It's like God's fault because, you know, you gave me that woman and that's what she did, you know? And if we stick with the theme of, of, of understanding God is a graceful God and a grace-filled God, then we, in our 21st century, look upon the notion of this, um, I will admit this to you, O God, and, and, and say that I know you have the power, but this is, this is my erstwhile confession to you. Um, but that wasn't their, their thinking, but for our purposes and, and how we move in the world, um, 
Con that's why confession to God, especially as a corporate community and community and saying this is where we find ourselves is so important because if, if we can acknowledge it out loud, then we can also affirm what it is that we need to do in order to bring ourselves back in, in line with God. And we can make that ask. And but we have to sort of say, this is what we've done wrong. Um, this is not the, not the I'm not laying confession over the lament in the Psalms. I'm not laying that over. I am extracting um, the, the process of naming what we've done wrong um, out of lament into our practice of confession and into our practice of testimony and our, our practice of getting on our knees and saying, God, I've done wrong. So I want you to see how that progressed over time. And then we get to go to Isaiah. Isaiah, the, the, the prophet who we talk about, who has those three different sections, um, the first, the second, and then the, the third sections of, of Isaiah, um, which I really love him saying, you all messed up. We gonna get sent away. We away because we messed up. Because we messed up and we went away, God's gonna bring us out. Just watch, and God does. So we're now at Isaiah 64, that third part, where it's more about we're on our way out. And this is a, the book of Isaiah is laid over our advent very often every year. Um, even Handel's Messiah, uh, Linda, you know, the Hallelujah Chorus and all the stuff that, that comes from that. Many of those texts are from the book of Isaiah. Real. Comfort ye, comfort, yeah, many of them are. Uh, well, mo all of them are actually. And um, so we have a great, we have great um, understanding that Isaiah speaks to us about the coming Christ as Christians. So this is why we will always find Isaiah sort of always woven throughout our Advent um, season and our Christmas season. This is a prayer of communal lamentation. Isaiah 60, 60, oh, sorry, I messed this up. 61, um, verse 3 through 64, verse 12, is a prayer of communal lamentation. And this prayer of communal lamentation um, is a passionate, I say lamentation because I want us to understand that lamentation is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow and weeping but it's not mourning. I wanna make that distinction. I had a conversation last evening um, with someone about grief and mourning and the, the difference between the two, which I'll bring up at another point, but it, it raises the point that this book of Isaiah is not talking about um, this mourning. It's talking about grief and grief or sorrow for what is gone. Um, is a grief. This is a grief and sorrow um, for what is for what has gone and what has been lost, but can be regained by the favor of God. Right, and mourning and grief is a sorrow. Um, uh, no, sorry, I'm sorry. This this first one, this lamentation, is a grief or sorrow for what is gone. Um, no, mourning is a grief or sorrow for what is gone. I'm so sorry. And this grief or sorrow that we're talking about in this text of lamentation is for what is lost, but can be regained by the favor of the Lord. So grief, very often in our texts are being talked about in terms of something that was lost and that can, um, that can be regained by the favor of God and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me give this straight. A passionate expression of grief. Weeping, not mourning. A grief or sorrow for what is gone. This lamentation is a is a weeping and a grief or and a, and a sorrow. Let me put it. It's a sorrow for what is lost but can be regained by God. And our mourning when someone passes away is for someone that is gone, that is not coming back. I wanted to look at it in terms of death and I'll clear that up before I publish this. But it's that whole idea that lamentation 
is for something that is lost, but God can bring that back. And that's what the expression is. But the, but the, but the mourning and the grief that we have for death or for a society that is gone, when we recognize that something is gone and not coming back, that's a whole other way of how we have to process that and how we have to hold that. So I want you to hear this as a lamentation that is a painful, sorrowful um, notion, but for something that can be regained. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, nor ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, or should I say, Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. So now consider we are all your people. Now, this is sad. Verses one through theory is a direct appeal to God and very characteristic of lament Psalms for God to intervene, to appear as power, as in the days of old. They've been in, in exile for a long time. There has been no pillar of fire by night or cloud to guide by day. No remembrance of, of the fires and the smokes burning from the temple that showed that God is present in the tabernacle and, in the, and sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. There is none of that, the temple has been destroyed. So God, please come. Please come tear heavens down and now make our enemies who laughed at us, who treat us like we're nothing, who have trampled over us, who have ravished us and ravaged us. Come to us, O oh God. In verse five, the prophet reiterates the Lord's anger and the hidden, God's hidden face from the people. But you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself, we transgressed. This language, in the, even in the commentary, Having been ravaged, the nation now has become impure. And no one calls on the Lord because the Lord is the source of the punishment. So we, you hid yourself because we transgressed and we have taken on that shame. This language of ravaged and shame. If you remember what I said earlier in the Psalm about the notion of, of the feminine and the masculine in this patriarchal world, um, this whole idea of, of Israel taking on the notion that it's been ravaged. 
um, think about that in terms of what that actually means and how Israel has this, um, this complex of a woman who is taken advantage of and what happens in their legal, their own legal system for a woman who has been ravaged because of her own iniquity. She is cast out and she is able actually to be stoned and killed. This is a powerful lament and confession of the people of Israel. We sinned. They say we brought upon our own ravaging, even though that's very problematic for how the Levitical laws are written because they were written so that, you know, men could divorce easily and all that stuff. But this whole idea that, for example, uh, and I'll give you the, the Levitical example. If you were taken by someone within the bounds of the community, um, so like within the city of, and one of the cities of Israel, one of the tribes of Israel, and you named your attacker, so on and so forth, then, you know, it wasn't as a woman, you still got sort of pushed aside, but at least in your shame, um, that person had to take care of you, <laughs> unfortunately, or, or something had to be paid to your family for your virtue, so on and so forth. But if say, for example, a gentleman took you in the middle of the night and took you out into the middle of the wilderness and took advantage of you and 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 sexually assaulted you and they found out about it then that's your fault that's that's sort of the inkling of how it how it's sort of like the generalities of how the law works out it's like you didn't do anything to stop it or to cry out enough so you you were ravaged in soil and we have no proof that you know that it wasn't adultery so you take that blame and you take that um that sense of being outside it's a very very painful way of thinking about um how people are treated when they are um traumatized but yet israel takes on that notion of being traumatized um and that we beg you to take us back in because we are all our righteous deeds everything that we did is like a filthy cloth like now we're like a we faded like a leaf and we can be take take us away like the wind and we don't even call on your name because we know that anything that we've done to take a hold of you it's sort of where we've from it's from the space in which we've sinned um it's it's painful but it's the reality of the text um unfortunately and the reason i can be so certain about that is because it it's threaded all throughout especially first testament texts and some of our some of our um, New Testament texts, it's woven in in the, in the subtext of it in terms of how people are conquered. Um, this trauma that you exercise, and we all know that it's still, it's still a, a, a process of conquering and war and colonization now, is to subdue people sexually and traumatize them and make them feel as if they have no worth. Um, and it's sort of lifted up that in, in this sort of analogy, but yet, after all that heavy trauma stuff I was just talking about, there's still a belief in verse eight, yet you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. Verses eight through 12 is a final appeal for the Lord to cease the divine silence, bring us back from the wilderness and the punishment of the nation. Now that the temple is destroyed, the Lord's relationship with the nation is in jeopardy. Um, this verses eight through 12, that also sort of puts together this whole notion of like our relationship with God is in jeopardy because our, we've been taken from our house. But this clay and potter theme in the 64th chapter of Isaiah, 
It's, it's had a, an entire um, journey through the book of Isaiah. And it's not, I'll say, it's not like the one in Jeremiah, but hear these, hear these words. The clay potter theme in Isaiah is consistent with 2916, Isaiah 29, 16, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? Shall the things, shall the thing made of its maker say he did not make me or the thing formed say of one who formed it, he has no understanding. And then also in 45, verse nine, woe to you who strive with your maker, earthen vessels with the potter. Does the clay say to the one who fashions it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. This is from these, incredulous confrontations with God. Who do you think is in charge here? In the primary and the secondary um, Isaiah, there's this, God is still saying, I'm the potter here, you're not in charge. But this verse in the third trito Isaiah is an acknowledgement of God's authority. You are our father, the clay, we're the clay and you are our potter. We're all the work of your hand. God is incredulously and in consternation saying this in these other two spaces in the book of Isaiah. And here the people have finally got it <laughs> in the 64th chapter and says, we get it. And the difference that I want you to note, the difference between you know Jeremiah which is one of the ones that we often think of when we think about the potter and the clay. It, the imagery is always from Jeremiah and not from Isaiah. Warning um, that God is the potter and we are the clay. Um, Jeremiah 18, um, which Israel then scoffs upon it. God says, I, I want you to go and find a potter and go to the potter's house. You know, we all know that. Go to the potter's house and there you will see on a wheel you know, a, a pot being formed, and I am the potter. And this is when all the people are, Jeremiah is saying this to the people, say, God is trying to say, listen to what God is doing. God has made you. And they decide to go another route with the Assyrians and are beat horribly and taken into exile. But this whole way that is brought forth in the book of Isaiah, I really love how beautiful it is that they, they journey with it. They journey with their own sense of, of identity, their own sense of um, self-evaluation um, that they are in charge and that they still have a, a, have, a, have a sense of that they can lead God in the way that they think God needs to go. And finally here, right before chapter 65, before the end where they're being able to be sent back home, they admit, we finally get it. We are the clay and you are our potter. So do with us what you will, make us ready. And we are ready after all of this longing and all of this being out in the wilderness, we are longing for the structure of your gift and of your love and to be, for you to, be, to put your hands on us again and make, us up, make, a, make of us what you will. Isaiah. Any thoughts, my friends? I think the scripture has a lot of power to it. Yeah. Um, all the words are strong words. And um, when you listen to the tone of it, uh, the fire causes water to boil. Mm -hmm. um, you hear a lot of the mountains quaked. You hear a lot of um, very strong imagery. Yeah. And so you know that the emotions in it are very, um, you know, they're very passionate and strong, and and yet declare it. I mean, you know, they're declaring things. They are stating this is what it should be, and you know, I mean, again, it looks at how we and still to today we constantly, you know, ask ourselves, you know, what does it take to get that God's favor, and and we're always, you know, questioning and you know, even ourselves to say, you know, are we pleasing to what God wants us to be? 
and, and doing what we know God would want us to do. And when we don't, um, you know, uh, again, if you look at the language, uh, deeds are like a filthy cloth. You can fade like a leaf. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's all very strong, very, very strong imagery. And you know what, and you know what, Linda, we, in our, in our life with, uh, with, with Christianity and our, our calling upon Jesus, um, very often as our savior, we very rarely, um, rest in the lament. So we don't get an opportunity very often to, we don't even read really the book of Lamentations, which is another one of the texts that's not really a part of our canon in the way that we read things, but it's a very, it's, it's sort of like, they're very strong words and very strong prayers. And the, 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 lament, the Lamentation Psalms are very powerful with the language that they use because they're very vibrant and very vivid in terms of understanding their separation from God. And, and the words are very emotive. They're very yeah. emotional. I mean, you, when you read them, you feel the emotion, um, not only just of what, uh, God, what they're asking of God, but also you can feel what they believe the response will be. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that the um, language, you know, is very vivid. Mm -hmm. um, and picturesque, you know, brings images in your brain, but yeah. it begins extremely strong, you know, like tear open the heavens and come Ooh. down, you know? Yes. And then it ends like a, 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 a whispered conversation with a parent, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you're my dad, you know? Mm -hmm. You're my dad. That mm. kind of thing, you know, it's, it's interesting. You're still, you're still my daddy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Still my daddy. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get this clear for myself here for a second. I want to make sure. You know, it, it's hard for me because the Book of Lamentations is. Um, is a is a big cry about the the whole idea of the temple being destroyed and so on and so forth but i can't remember i think it's pieces of jeremiah and isaiah that are attributed to that i think but there's a whole other section that is not in our text named lamentations that is in the hebrew tradition is named lamentations and it's actually the prayer for one day of the, of fasting that they do they read only that text and it's this kind of language. But as I always say about Lamentations, Lisa, and you brought this up beautifully, at the end of Lamentations, there's always this understanding, okay, God's gonna bring me through, then God hears me. What is that, that Psalm Jesus prayed, Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes. I should pull that up as a, as that's, that's a lament. And even that Jesus is quoting on the cross, you know, many of, very often in our seven last words, we talk about, you know, the fact that Jesus is saying these words, but Jesus, and in several of the instances is actually quoting the words of comfort of his scripture on the cross. My God, my God, why? It's Psalm 22. That's what it is. Psalm 22. Why are you so far from saving me? I cry out, but you don't answer me. Um, da, 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 da. I pour out like water. Rescue me from the lions. And then the other things where he's talking about the fact that, you know, they, they, they um, barter for my clothes. They cast lots for my clothes. They give me, um, you know, 
bad wine to drink, so on and so forth. And this is, Christ is actually quoting the Psalms. And I love to think of it in my interpretation of the quoting of the Psalms as that Jesus, as a Jewish person, is going to the text that he's supposed to go to in order to bring himself comfort. Because the laments always say, God, I'm going to leave it in your hands. I'm asking you to come back. And if you do this, like that verse nine, you are our father. So remember us, we are all your people. Do not remember our iniquity, just come back to us. Um, and every lament is like that. And I love the idea that when we lament, um, you know, we say in, in, our, in our language, we say weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That's the promise of the end of the lament. That's the, that's the promise of the lament, is that very scripture. So you'll find those as we move forward and go through text. Our Corinthians reading for this Advent, first Sunday of Advent is 1 Corinthians 1 verses three through nine. Um, this is Paul's prescript, part of his prescript, prescript being his regular pattern of greeting um, to, the, to the Christ followers of the church, uh, to the Christ followers in Corinth. Once again, I say Christ followers rather than the church in Corinth because the church didn't, that whole idea of being named the church outside, um, being known as the church did not come about until um, later on after the first century, after the second century. And Paul's writings happened um, sort of way before actually um, the gospels. So the whole idea of the church being the church while Paul was around was really just a bunch of Christ follower communities. And to be named a church actually was to be named a church by um, Rome, which was a bad word. It meant that you were one of those people. And that, that's how they, are you, you're part of that church, you're part of that church rather than the household, rather than the Christ following community or the people of, which is very familiar, the people very, very often, the people of the way. So this is who Paul is writing to in this priest. And who was the way? The way of Jesus. Do you, are you the in way the way? Do, do okay. you follow the okay. way of Jesus? That was sort of like the okay. code. Do you follow the way okay. of Jesus? We are people of, we're, we're the people of the way. <laughs> oh. Okay. Or you would draw a little fish in the sand. Oh. <laughs> All right. So that, mm -hmm. that connects to the fish sign. For, yeah. For, okay. Yeah. Hmm. So Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus. He will strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. And by him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Seems all so nice and sweet, doesn't it? Good old Paul giving the standard thanksgiving in the prescript comparable to the assurance of prayer for other ancient letters that, you know, prayer for, prayer for these addresses, addressees of other ancient letters written by so many others. It's a beautiful way to say, I'm so grateful for you and let me lift up your gifts. However, <laughs> however, Paul gives thanks for the grace of God given to the Corinthians, not for their labors of love. Thessalonians 1.3 in that prescript, when Paul is speaking to those in Thessalonica, he is very excited about their labor of love. Yeah, the grace of God, you need the grace of God, y'all. Uh, you love this whole idea for this speech. 
I give thanks for your speech and knowledge of every kind. These are attainments of which the Corinthians are proud. So Paul is very selective to mention these gifts. Speech and knowledge is what is ripping this church apart. Those who think that they have the gift of tongues are holding it over those who don't have the gifts of tongues, the, the gifts of speech and tongues. Corinth is a, is a very busy, highfalutin city, and people are always making these philosophical deductions and sort of looking at people who don't have as much education and looking down on them, and it's tearing the church apart. So that way, when Paul says he will strengthen you to the end, Paul's language of assurance that God will strengthen the Corinthians contains what I put in quotes as my parentheses, a mild reproach of their instability. <laughs> so when you're reading the book of Corinthians, you got to read between the lines. You're so busy focused on speech and knowledge that it's breaking you apart and weakening you. But I'm writing you this letter because I'm telling you that he will strengthen you to the end so that you can be blameless because right now you're not blameless. God is faithful and you're supposed to be faithful. You were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's a scathing letter. But it also speaks to Paul's and our theme of longing and this advent of, come on, y'all, look in the mirror and stop focusing on everything else that's going, look out, stop looking in the world and worried about everything else that's going on and how to hold one thing over another or think that you're better, think that you're richer, think that you're poorer, this and that, blah, 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 blah. We don't have time for that. Paul's like, I pulled you together as a people of Corinth because Jesus is coming back, y'all. Will you be ready? So in this short six little verses is really the foundation of, of Paul laying out his whole argument and his whole chastisement of the people of Corinth. And when you read it through that lens, it's pretty scathing. And when you think about speech and knowledge, how many of you who are, I want you to, if you're unmuted, I want you to say this, what is the, what is the main thing that you remember from 1 Corinthians 13? If you have not love, you're a claim symbol. Right. Mm -hmm. If I have these gifts, and you notice he, he talks about this, if I, if I can speak, if I have knowledge, but don't have love. Oh, you have anything. So you see how this first, these first six verses are connected to this chapter 13 in a big way. We love to look at it and like, oh, it's great at weddings and oh, it's such a beautiful text. It is him in the middle of this whole, this whole tirade against them saying, you are so proud of your tongues. You're so proud of all of this stuff. So proud of the, the hierarchy of gifts. But if you don't have love, And he lays it out. He starts laying it out here. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Well, yeah, because it's kind of deceptive. I mean, it sounds <laughs> like he's being nice to them. Well, you got to remember there are 12 other chapters before 13. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe he's building them up after whatever. He is. Know. He does unravel it. He does yeah, unravel yeah. it through those chapters. Okay. But I wanted you to know that for, for our purposes, especially for our purposes before Advent, it's like, let's not focus on, on the, all those, those things that we think are important in the world. What are we waiting for? And we have been, we have to be faithful. We've been called into fellowship with, with Christ so that we can be blameless. And we have to ready ourselves for this kind of world where God comes, where God's will and God's kingdom is. So this yeah, is 
he's leaning saying, out. He's trying to tell, you know, so that you're, he, I guess it's a warning of some type to say, you know, hey, you got to think because you want to be ready. You know that him, I want to be ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he so mentioned, he, and, and this is, this is after he left Corinth and after he settled the church on um, this first Corinthians, first and second Corinthians are two separate letters. And they are the most specific example we have of Paul writing to his communities in response to something that is happening in the community. It's the most, it's the clearest notion of Paul writing to correct um, and to correct the people um, that we have, which is what all of his letters are. It's really addressing something that he started this church, he started, I mean, started this community, these Christ following communities and these households, and everything was all honky dory and was all loving and all this other stuff. He goes away and then he gets reports back from his disciples and people who say, by the way, Chloe is talking about this. This person is talking about who baptized them and who has better authority over who baptized them. These people are talking about, oh, I have the gift of tongue, and that means that you have nothing. I don't care if you can preach, and I don't care if you can exhort. I have the gift of tongues. Hmm. And there, it's been reported back to them, and it's, it's gotten so, in some of the communities, I can't remember if it's Corinth, but the affluent get to the worship services and get to the opportunities and the greetings first, and they drink all the good wine before communion. Because the communion wine and the communion and wine and eating bread, that was all a part of the meal. It was all a part of the gathering. So when you, when you drink the wine and you eat the bread so that the poor who are coming in later, the slaves who are coming in to worship Jesus, who want to avail themselves to that, if they don't have that, they're like, get over yourselves. Or better yet, stop, remember, you're getting back to being the way you were. Or as I like to say in, in many examples, um, by the way, your street is showing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Remember back in the day when you, when, you, when you didn't change your walk and didn't change your talk. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to it because we are trying to be ready for this promise of God. We've asked God to, to look at us, to look at our brokenness and to say, make us what you will. Paul's like, don't forget that that's what, that's what we're doing in this. God is making us what God will so that when Jesus comes again, we'll be ready. Mm. So it's a loving admonition, but it's also, it can also be read very brutally. I mean, it's, it's, it's it's beautiful in that way, you know. There's some irony in it, some of it. Mm -hmm. it's just just a little. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah very ironic. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, you all? Hearing none. Oh, couldn't click off quick enough. What'd you say? Yeah, as I couldn't click it off quick enough, I didn't know if I did it. I was just thinking, um, in my head. Um, with everything that was said, Paul loved them dearly. I know, right? He loved them dearly. I mean, he just didn't want them to mess up. And, and they were his heart. He would they were his heart. Them. Yeah, he would rather correct them than have the wrath of God correct them. He would take, yeah. he would take the hit first. Mm. And even in his second letter, um, the, the, the idea, when you, do the, when you do a lot of the, the extra reading, the idea that he wrote a second letter to the Corinthians, it's not like, you know, first and second Thessalonians and the first and second. When he wrote a, the second letter to the Corinthians, he thought that the first letter had worked. Right. <laughs> so he took the extraordinary tech, the extraordinary tactic of writing a second letter. Yeah. And what he says in that, you know, we very often stick with First Corinthians, but oh. it's very strong. Strong. Because he loves them. He doesn't he he's like you are you're supposed to be the cornerstone of a, a gem. You're able to be a gem and 
you're able to like get offerings for other churches and other and other communities are looking at you and and I'm sorry if I keep going back and forth between that language of churches. You can see how hard it is to sort of shift your thought from the first church, the first churches in the early Christ following communities. It's really hard to, to change your language with that. So I ask your, your patience with me as I do that. I've been doing that. I do that back and forth. Sometimes I'm always talking about the Christ following community. People are like, what are you talking about? And other times I'm always saying the church, the church are like, what do you mean? Where are the Christ following communities? What are you talking about? Yeah, it's hard. It is, it is hard. <laughs> and and they were like his special ed kids. When they got it, they got it. And when they right. were off, they were just off. And when they got it, they were awesome. They were awesome. Mm -hmm. Couldn't beat them. And so now we have the Gospel of Mark. You know, we've been in Matthew, and this is really the first gospel, y'all. It starts out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's really Mark is first, because we know that Mark, this short book, is the one from which the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, draw heavily upon. Um, they draw heavily upon Mark and expand and switch things around and so on and so forth. But it's really the book of Mark, which we believe was written first, and that is really the proto prototype for how to write a gospel um, in terms of writing a gospel for Christ. So there's a lot more forthrightness in the book of Mark. There's also a lot of, um, it's, it's inferences to First Testament texts to which people would have known um, are a little bit more obscure, but they're there nonetheless. And they're like obscure, more obscure texts for us Christians. Um, it's not, we don't point, like in this particular text, we're not going to be pointing to, Le, to the Levitical text or to the Torah. Um, we're actually going to be talking about like Daniel. <laughs> so, um, verses 24 and 25 hearken to many of the First Testament texts. Um, in those days, and the word, the phrase in those days is shorthand for the day of the Lord when God's kingdom will prevail. Remember again, we're not talking about our whole idea of apocalypse. That is, you know, the earth blowing up and us sort of going up in spirits one by one or being left behind. But it's when God's kingdom will prevail is the, the thought of the first century. So hear these words, Mark 13, 24 through 37. Hmm. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in clouds, quote unquote, with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So that when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn. 
or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Sometimes when you read these out loud, okay. they just hit you in a whole other way. Woo. Yeah. Verses 26 through 27. Um, the son of man, this assumes that the heavenly throne um, after the beasts have set upon them and the, the, the heavenly throne that the beasts have been sitting upon have been deposed, which is a reference to Daniel 7, 13 through 15. So when I talk about the empire being seated and and the will of God being usurped and the will of will of God being down here and the will of uh, these um, evil people being up here sort of running the world being usurped they're sitting on God's throne and it needs to be overturned so that's this notion of the four beasts the beasts have been deposed um, when this happened so it's this son of man, it's all with the assumption that the heavenly throne has been taken over and the will of God has been taken over and those beasts have been deposed. You'll find this beast language also in the book of Revelation. The beasts are very often um, just a metaphor for the Roman emperors. The seven hills are the seven cities of Rome, which are the seven city or the 10 cities of Rome, which are the Decapolis. Um, the 10 major cities of Rome, and there are other seven cities that are even more major by the time John the Revelator comes about. But these, this, these metaphorical, this metaphorical language is all about this, this way that um, we understand this shift to happen so that God's kingdom will prevail. Then he will send out angels and, the, and gather his elect from, four, from the four winds, the winds of heaven. These are the winds of heaven the four winds of heaven. And the elect comprise all of those who remain loyal to God's reign, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, or religious tradition. So it don't matter if you're Presbyterian. What matters is that you are loyal to this idea that God is in control and that God that our God reigns, how lovely on the mountain on the, are the feet of him. You know, our God reigns, our God reigns. That's, that's what we're talking about here. It's, um, and you will be, we will be gathered up and taken to the ends of the heavens. This fig tree, Jesus has many words about fig trees in the gospels. If you think about Jesus' words earlier in Mark, it always talks about watching the fig tree to know when the seasons come. Very often there's, even when, when Jesus is talking to some of the people and he's saying, you know, you know when the signs are coming, you all know when summer is coming, you know when the, lead, when the fig trees are about to sprout, you know summer is coming, you know all these things. You, how come you don't know this? You know when the rains are coming, you know, you have to be aware of, of the signs when you see them. So, and that's just an obvious one. It's like the, the, the pruning of the, of the fig tree, which we talk about very often, gets cut all the way back to its branches. Like there is this huge tree, and I keep giving this image, that just blossoms and all these figs fall and you pick all these figs. And then you go up and you cut off all those huge 15 foot branches down to the nub. So that is just the trunk with these little nubs on it. But as soon as you start to see the branch sprout in the spring, it starts putting forth its leaves and becomes very tender. In a very short amount of time, those figs blossom. So you all know this. Figs are a major, major staple of food in the Middle East. So I'm using this analogy so that you know when you see the winds, you know, when you, when, when you see the winds, when you see the stars falling from heaven, when the sun is darkened and the moon doesn't give its light, watch the signs. 
In the book of Revelation, John the Revelator, he uses a lot of this language um, because he knows that in, in the book of Revelation, this has already happened to people. When Mount Vesuvius erupted, the sun was darkened and the moon didn't give its light. And it seemed as if the stars were falling from heaven and that the heavens were being shaken. So think about what you know about Mount Vesuvius, this explosive volcano that, that literally caught people and, and put them, turned them into ash where they stood. For days and days and days and weeks after that, there was ash flying everywhere and there was no sun and there was no moon. So much so that the Romans were afraid of it and didn't know what to make of it. So this, this language that has been in the, the previous Testament text, in, in the first Testament text, is alive and well also in the first Testament texts, in the second test, in our, in our New Testament texts. So the imagery is fresh as well. So these are natural metaphorical things that are uh, metaphysical things, met, natural cosmological things that are happening in the universe that are of course not attributed to meteorology. This is God. And you know, you've seen some of these things before. When it happens again, I'm telling you that this is what it's going to mean. So be ready. And this generation, very often we thought, I always thought when I first started reading these texts, Truly, I tell you, this generation, like, you all are going to be saved. You won't pass away until these things have taken place. And it confused me when I was younger, saying, what do you mean? These people won't die? Of course they died. But this connotes a generation that is unfaithful to God's priorities. So you're looking at all these people out here, all these evil people, all this stuff going away, and you think that God's going to take care of them before God comes back. No, that, they're not going to pass away until all that happens. You may see land masses fall. You may see, you may see millions of people dying from a pandemic. But if you don't see that sun darken and the moon not be seen, and you don't see the winds gathering God's elect from the four corners of the earth and to whisk them to heaven, they gonna be around. <laughs> but remember my words will be here. And this is the truth by which you must go. And then Jesus said, I, I took a break between verses 31 and 32, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away because I wanted you to hear the si in that silence what you would say. Jesus, when is this going to happen? You know that this is, you know, because you're the son of God, you're the son of man, you're talking about this. Come on, Jesus, please. In the book of Mark, so many people call Jesus the son of man and the son of God, and he's like, shh, don't tell anybody. It's the Mark in secret. All throughout, even, the strangest thing is that even in the end, when Mary finds him at the tomb, he says, now go and tell everybody that I've resurrected and that, that God has done what God is doing. And then the very end of the first ending of Mark, it says, and she went and she told no one for she was sore afraid. <laughs> so the one time he gives her permission to say something, she doesn't do it. And then they tack on some other pieces so that we get the full, the full story. But this generation ain't going nowhere, y'all. The evil that we see in the world ain't going nowhere. It will not be eradicated until these signs. And, but don't ask me when. Don't think that you can predict it. Don't think that you can logically look at the stars and, and, and predict it from your astronomy. Don't think that, oh, Nostradamus has it right. And don't think this and don't think that. Because no one knows about that. Not even the angels, not even me. So I'm exhorting you to readiness in 32 through 37. And God will come back like an absentee landlord to see what care 
the tenants have taken. These are the four segments of the night watch. The evening, guard changes. Midnight, guard changes. Cock crow, guard changes. At first, at dawn, when, when things start raising up, guard changes. So you don't, and that's when you can't see out in the dark, even if you're on top of the gate with all the, the lanterns around you, you still can't see 200 feet in front of you in the dark. So even if you're on watch, you have to watch and make sure that you can see when the master is coming. But if he finds you asleep, that's not, it's not good. <laughs> so I tell you to keep awake. So brothers and sisters, we are the doorkeepers on watch. The doorkeepers on watch this advent for Christ to come. So it's a matter of both waiting for Christ to be born and for Christ to return because the presence of Christ in the world um, as we recognize it is a call for hope, a call for a realization that God's kingdom and God's will is going to prevail and that we keep watch and that we don't get distracted by words and knowledge and that we make that lament to God and say, we are clay and you are the potter. On all of these things, next week, when we focus in on our lectionary text, we'll be moving from longing, from longing to consolation, from all of this. All this longing that we've been espousing in this particular text, these particular texts today, we will now be moving to them being our consolation that will come to us in our heart to ready us for Christ to come. Your final thoughts in these closing moments. I'd just like to say that that theme of watching and waiting has been repeated several times in the past few weeks yeah and it's not only watching and waiting it's what we're doing while we're watching and waiting you know that's, that's, what, I, that's what i preached on making right. it, when will we yeah. be church ready <laughs> mm -hmm. but even looking at all that's going along in in israel and mm -hmm. you know, we're, you know we're praying everybody's yeah. praying it doesn't matter where you are in the whole you're just praying for for God to intervene and to make sense of it and uh, to bring it to an end and stop the suffering and, and do our best to make to make the make the world do our best to say but God we do know your will and we're doing our best to make it happen we're trying to feed people. We're trying to love people. We're trying not to isolate people. We're trying to make justice happen. We're trying to take care of your earth, God. That's what we're trying to do so that when you do come, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's our joy. I had a conversation with a couple of people over the um, concept of the end times and mm -hmm. when Jesus would return and I, basically I said that's none of our business <laughs> none of our business <laughs> that um you know based on that text that says even yeah. Jesus doesn't know you know only God knows mm -hmm. the angels don't know you mm -hmm. know um and Jesus never told us to um focus on when he would be coming back our focus is on what are we doing while we're waiting for him to come back? You know? And you know, Lisa, that has played into um, the way we are in the world and the way that the way not not we, but the way the world treats one another and treats the world itself. It's like, well, those of us who are the elect, um, we can do what we want 
because it's all going to be over and those who are going to God are going to God. So if it's if there's oppression and if there's and people are suffering, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps because, you know, that's what that we're here. We are. Everything is fine. And, you know, we're going to church and God will forgive us. And, you know, we're doing this and blah, 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 blah. And all of that kind of stuff. We can take we can destroy the earth because, you know, God's going to take care of it. And, you know, even even when this one is if the, if we mess up this one, then, you know, God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth for centuries. That has been the way that we've treated one another and treated treated the world is by distorting this notion of. Um, well, when the time comes, I'll be lifted up. I don't have to do anything. You know, the end times is the millennialism, which is what that was known as before millennials took that for their generation. Uh, millennialism, that's what it was all about, the end times. And all we have to do is wait for God to come and we have to give ourselves to God. All that other stuff that we're doing, you know, slavery, genocide, all the other stuff we're guilty for is not compatible even with that. But and yet and still millennialism and the end of times has been used to scare people into submission. But there's no accountability. On the nose. And Christ is very clearly calling people to be accountable here. Because it's not just being awake for the watch persons on the on the gate. It's also this whole idea, when a man goes on a journey, he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge. That means that the work still has to be done on the household while the landlord's away. The harvest has to be planted. It has to be harvested. And you never know when the master is coming back. So that's that one little piece that I didn't focus on a lot, but that's what that he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each doing his work. He commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. We have to do our work and be on watch. And this next few weeks is sort of like our play acting of what it's like to watch and wait and then celebrate when he comes. Every year we get to do that. So Linda, that's the joy of Advent. Every year we get to make ourselves ready and then Christ comes. So are we all good? Yeah. Then we further wait for his second coming, correct? Yes. And, and waiting for his first coming for Christmas is our practice. Okay. So we get to sort of go through that every year. <laughs> okay. So when I we celebrate it. the birth of Christ. So if you remember, the Jewish people were waiting for the birth of their Messiah, the one to bring them out and to bring them through. So Christians are waiting for the second coming of Christ who will bring us out and bring us through. So it's sort of the same way of looking at things, but we celebrate that. But isn't the Jews, the Jews Messiah is not, who's the, who? The Jews so Messiah is, is, is someone who will usher in God's reign. And some people and are they think that he hasn't come yet. Jesus? No, they, they think he, they believe that Jesus is a prophet, but not that he oh. is the one that ushers in God's. And that's that's the mate. That's where we differ. <laughs> mm -hmm. As Brad Braxton says, before we get all started, I, I need you all to understand in any class I teach, whether I break apart the text or not, I believe that he got up. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that the power of him coming in a manger and the power of us waiting and and recognizing that our faith in God is that as we said all year long the faith is God's promise and knowing God will 
And here we are now on the eve of the biggest God doing what God said would do, God said he would do. It goes back to uh, John's question. Are you, are you the one? And Jesus sent the disciples back to tell him, you know, tell him what you've seen. Yeah. Yeah, tell him what you've seen. That's our job. <laughs> that's our job. That's it. Oh, Ooh. Ooh, yeah. may yeah, we on. move on this journey and on this pathway to you, O oh Christ. And may we, may we look at the hopelessness in this world and know that God's hope is real and that, that it's a mask. All we have to do is look up because there is a star in the east. And it wasn't just on Christmas morn because the, the three wise persons had to travel far watching that star which had ascended way before the physical birth. Your promise is there. So may we look up this Advent season, oh God. May we look up and look to you. May we look up and look to the star that will guide us to the manger, that will guide us to the remembrance that hope is real and promised and that it is contained in the very words that we read because we call ourselves followers of Christ. We call ourselves the church. And that is what we do. So give us this opportunity to celebrate this birth and how we bring about this hope. And let us be reminders that this joy that we're about to have is our responsibility to lift up and share. And may we feel it and may it start to burn in our hearts and may we smile every day of the month of December so that people don't know what it is. And when we say Merry Christmas, it's not just happy gift given that you're getting. We're saying, here is hope. Be happy. Yes. Merry Christmas. Amen. That's what we're praying in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.